Hi, I'm Dave Smith. Uh, it's been a while since I've made a video for my YouTube channel. You know, it's a time-consuming process, but I have some time today. Um, so I think I'll do one. Uh, and I'm going to talk about one of the more important concepts, I think, on my channel, which is transformations. Um, it's one of the better things that I have to offer. So I hope you don't mind hearing about it. So what is a transformation? Well, there's a general meaning that everyone knows, which is a change from one thing to another. Um, the idea of transformation, I think, includes that it's not something instant, suddenly like a discontinuity, something goes from this to this. That's not a transformation. Transforming includes change. There's an emphasis on process. Um, when I was a small boy, perhaps second or third grade, I had a children's reader, and in that reader were illustrated stories, one of which was about the life cycle of frogs. And the pictures showed the stages in the process as a frog went from an egg you know, to a polywog, they grow the first the back legs, then the front legs, the tail was shrinking away, the body of the frog was forming, and eventually you end up with, with a frog that goes out of the water and goes on to land. So that's a story that I read, uh, maybe I was age 10, and it made a profound impact on me. You know, obviously I'm, you know, I'm 57 years old now and I'm still talking about it. But the effect was not intellectual curiosity only. You know, there was an emotional uh, 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 effect attached to that story. Um, because, of course, as I now know, childhood is also a time of growth and transformation. And growth is a slow process, but it is a process of change. So I think that story about the frogs was important to me personally because, you know, I myself was changing, and perhaps uh, not in quite a radical way as the frog, but my body even was changing. So the general definition of transformation is a process of change. Um, but let's look a little bit at my work on this. Uh, what I learned, at least initially by way of uh, Elias Canetti, is that our, our way of understanding ourselves doesn't really provide a satisfactory understanding of how human beings change. Um, in particular, from what we were, say, 10,000, 20,000 years ago to what we are now. That's not a very long time in biology. You know, 10,000 years is nothing in biology. But yet we seem really different. So we can't really explain our own development, and in particular we can't explain civilization using the present intellectual constructs that most people have. Those, con those constructs typically include ideas like progress or innovation, so most people, when they look at civilization or think about what it does, would say that it's about progress and it's fueled by innovations. And others would talk about ideals, the social contract. So we often understand the world through economic terms, or maybe we look at things through the prism of tradition. But most people actually don't think about any of those things. They just go about their daily lives, you know. <laughs> and what they know is what they experience. Their experience of civilization is just their day-to-day -day life being a part of it. They use it, they enjoy it, but they don't usually consider it very closely. It takes a disaster or a catastrophe, pandemic, something like that, which takes away a portion of what they're used to, and then they begin to consider how they live. So this is a good time for us to talk about these things. Now, the first concept of understanding transformations, in my sense of that word, is to perceive that the mental landscape of human beings is a self-reinforcing and self-regulating process. And what I mean by that is even as there is a process of homeostasis in the cells in our body, which keeps things moving forward smoothly with a myriad of unseen chemical interactions, you know, the same thing happens in the mind. There's a significant amount of mental activity which has no other purpose than just keeping things running smoothly for us. And that process involves opinion formation. Uh, in the general case, our opinions are maintained and they don't change. 
but rather we experience a sense of self-reinforcement, you know, of mental sameness that from day to day we're going along. There's nothing that a person likes better than discovering some hidden prejudices yet again demonstrated in their eyes to be correct, you know. And the opposite is also true. People really dislike having to change their ideas. It's painful. They will stubbornly maintain their views until they really cannot do that any longer. And then just on a dime, they will change direction and suddenly they're different. They've changed. So we can formulate a basic rule, which is that mental processes are conservative. And perhaps we could say mental processes actually are conserved. The energy of those processes is conserved. Uh, if there is to be change, it must take place in the context of the rest of mental processes. And there is an effort to persist the old and to try to weave new things into the old. So one of the main proofs for the supremacy of this homeostatic process, this, this model of the mind, is the way that human beings really crush logic and rationalism. You know, human beings have no difficulty living with dramatic contradictions like religion versus science, you know. So that's the first idea, home homeostasis of the mind. The next, this is like a prerequisite for transformations. The next idea is that the actual process by which we have change does not start out as an idea or an emotion or an intuition, but it starts out as a body experience, which also can have some or all of those other elements. So for human beings, change does not occur because someone explains some idea to you. You know, change does not occur because we have an emotion. Change does not occur because we have a sense of something. Change occurs only when we have a physical body experience. That is what causes change, mental change. Now, uh, now that might seem like a bold claim, but I'm going to go quite a bit further. I'm going to actually deny that what we call ideas are anything more than, at some stage, a body experience. It doesn't have to be necessarily on our own person, because the way civilization works is that Sometimes, you know, generally the first time an idea is born, that happens in a person somewhere else, and then that is propagated through messaging. You know, but the initial experience, the first person to ever have that idea, it happens in someone's body through their physicality. You know, you can think of the first time that somebody, uh, you know, made a wheel, the first time somebody made a weapon. You know, these are, these are things that we sort of inherit, uh, you know, through culture. But they started out as physical experiences. Now that physicality is the whole body, the whole person experiencing something. And from that experience, which is not yet broken out into abstractions and compartmentalized into the web of opinion formation, which is the normal homeostatic pattern of experience, there can come an idea. Um, now you might want some evidence of this. The most interesting example I can give you right now what I've seen lately is what I call earbudding. And that's my term for the practice, which has now become quite general, of using earbuds in ways that they were not necessarily anticipated by the designers. You know, like having one instead of both. And what happened was once human beings, you know, started using earbuds, which is quite an immersive experience, they quickly learned that they, they could be shared. You know, you have, you have two of them. And so one's here, you can give another one to somebody else. They also learned it's possible to use one earbud and leave the other out, and thus carry on with a less immersive experience. So what, idea, what ideas are coming through this learned ex physical experience of earbudding? Well, one is that there's a much deeper level of human-machine interaction and intimacy that is now becoming acceptable. Um, you know, we're sharing that intimacy. Another is that deeply immersive experiences are disorienting and they need to be softened out and connected to the physical world. Um, now you might say those aren't ideas, but the general practice of earbudding as it becomes more standard, those, those, those will generally become known and understood by, by everyone. Um, just like for, for us, everyone knows or is expected to know how to eat with a knife and fork, you know, it's, it's a body experience we come to see and learn in a, at a very early part of life. If you go to Southeast Asia, there are people who eat only with chopsticks, and they, they may or may not have used a knife and fork. Potentially, you could find people like that. 
they have a different transformation, which is the chopsticks. So I won't have convinced anyone about the, the above, uh, you know, that ideas are functions of body experiences, because we all believe quite wrongly that what is going on in our heads, for example, at this moment is ideation. You know, you think you're thinking, I, you know, but almost 100% of what you and I are doing right now is not ideation. It's homeostasis. Our mental, our, our mentalities are just on cruise control. You know, you're hearing my words, you're seeing my lips move. But what you understand me to say is, is really a function of what you already know, and it's being measured against that pattern. Whatever I say is being measured against the pattern in you. You know, it could be that what I say here is completely impossible for some people to understand. Even if they're native English speakers with fast internet connections and they can hear clearly what I say, they don't understand what I'm talking about. Um, they can't. Um, because it require it just goes against the, the homeostasis of the processes that are going on in them. So the third idea I'm going to present is that transformation occurs within a crowd. So changes take place. Changes take place. Uh, it's not just a body experience, which is the prerequisite for a new idea to be experienced. But typically, in order to actually experience an idea, some new thought, some new feeling, some intuition or perception, we have to be among a mass of other people. We have to be in a crowd. Now, when I say we have to be in a crowd, I have a somewhat, you know, convoluted idea of what a crowd is, which includes virtual crowds. So, for example, the set of all the people who are fathers makes up a vast crowd, you know, you can imagine. If you become a father, even if you're alone physically, those people who you have known who were fathers and all the living people who actually are fathers right now in your community that's the context of your experience of being a dad. And you actually feel, feel that. Now, this might seem like nonsense, but if you think about civilization and the way we're deeply in the midst of civilization, almost every single thing in your entire environment is to some extent genericized, it's generic. To some extent, everything around you, everything participates in a crowd because being generic means it's from a crowd. So for example, your car in the driveway is one of millions. You know, maybe it's a Toyota Corolla. There are millions of Toyota Corollas. It wasn't made specifically for you. It's one of millions of almost identical cars. So that is part of a crowd. Your clothes, you know, th this, this shirt was not made personally just for me. You could, you could do that, but this shirt was, was made, and there, there are thousands and thousands of shirts like this. It was made in a shirt factory. Your food, you know, there are about five animal species and about 35 plants that provide the majority of all the food you have ever eaten. And each of those types of food source, you know, there are millions and billions of those. You think how many chickens there are in the world. Uh, I think there are many more than humans. I think probably there are 10 times more chickens in the world today than there are human, human beings. Chickens are uh, uh, close to being the, the uh, uh, most populous bird, you know, avian species on the planet. So your life is full of crowds and the context in which you can experience ideas, that, uh, I'm saying that's a crowd context, not by yourself. If you think of a television set, I'd be willing to say definitively that unless you're Donald Trump, watching Fox and News, you know, like uh, Fox and Friends, no one has ever watched a television program made it, it, just for them, you know. All television programs are targeted at crowds, not individuals. So the point is that if you learn about a new product while you're watching television, you are doing that as part of a crowd. Even if you're sitting alone in your house, you're part of a crowd. So these are the underlying principles which prepare us to understand transformations, which is which is how human beings change. Uh, transformations are body experiences, which take place in the context of crowds, to people who are in a homeostatic condition to start with, who really are opposed to mental change, and they don't want to change. In order to have mental change, 
uh, really dramatic things have to happen, like 10 million people all at the same time seeing someone murdered by a policeman, you know, in real time. Even then, there, there have been hundreds of similar murders through excessive use of force by police, thousands. But what happens is that the experience of being taught, um, you know, people feel that on their bodies. You see protests where thousands of people are laying on the ground and they say, I can't breathe. You know, they act that out. So through that physical experience, they come to the abstraction, which is the idea of police brutality. Through their bodies, they come to that idea. And then the next logical step is to demand reforms. So, you know, this, this is how, so when I'm talking about transformations, basically what I'm saying is that's how human beings um, uh, 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 experience ideas. Ideas are essentially transformations. So if you found this interesting, I hope you will uh, subscribe to my channel. I have like two subscribers, so if you want to subscribe, that would be great. <laughs> Thanks for watching, and have a wonderful afternoon. Cheers. As we march down to Fenerio as we march down to Fenerio Our captain fell in love with a lady like a dove She called her by her name, pretty Peggy -o. Would you marry me, pretty Peggy O? Would you marry me, pretty Peggy O? If you would marry me, I would set your cities free. Free all the ladies in the area. I would marry you, pretty Peggy O. I would marry you, pretty Peggy O. I would marry you, but your guineas are too low. I fear my mama would be angry. Oh, what would your mama think, pretty Peggy O? What would your mama think, pretty Peggy O? What would your mama think if she heard my new guineas clink? Saw me marching at the head of my soldiers. I'm tripping down the stairs, pretty Peggy O. I'm tripping down the stairs, pretty Peggy O. I'm tripping down the stairs, pretty Peggy O. A bit of last farewell to your William O. Well, if ever I return, pretty Peggy O. If ever I return, pretty Peggy O. If ever I return, all your cities I will burn. Destroy all the ladies in the area. Well, sweet William, he is dead. Pretty Peggy, oh. Sweet William, he is dead. Pretty Peggy, oh. Sweet William, he is dead. They say he died for a maid. Is buried out there in the Louisiana country, oh. 
Well, as we march down to Frenario, as we march down to Frenario, our captain fell in love with the lady like a dove, and he called her by her name, pretty Peggy O. Called her by her name, pretty Peggy O.